Tomorrow marks six months since Hamas terrorists streamed into Israel, killing some 1,200 people and kidnapping more than 200. In response, Israel launched a war on Hamas, pounding the Gaza Strip starting in the north and moving to the south. According to Gaza Health Ministry, more than 33,000 Palestinians have been killed <clears throat> excuse me, since the war began. And during these past six months, the United States has stood lockstep with Israel. But we may be at a t critical turning point in that relationship in the wake of the Israeli airstrikes that killed seven aid workers from renowned relief organization World Central Kitchen on April 1st. In a report released yesterday, the Israel Defense Force called the strike a grave mistake after its own investigation found that serious errors and violations of protocol led Israeli forces to, quote, mistakenly assume Hamas gunmen were inside the aid vehicles. NBC News has not independently verified that claim. Two high-ranking members of the Israeli military have been dismissed from their posts, and three others have been formally reprimanded. World Central Kitchen says this is an important step forward, but it's not enough. The humanitarian organization is demanding an immediate independent investigation, pointing out, quote, the IDF cannot credibly investigate its own failure. The tragedy appears to have sparked a come-to-Jesus meeting between Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and President Biden, who suggested a showdown was coming during a hot mic moment after his State of the Union address last month. The meeting came in the form of a tense phone call on Thursday, during which the president underscored the need for an immediate ceasefire. Biden called the deadly strike on the aid workers unacceptable and for the first time suggested that there could be a shift in U.S. policy unless Netanyahu enacts, quote, a series of specific, concrete and measurable steps to address the protection of civilians in Gaza. In response, Israel has committed to opening additional aid routes that will allow desperately needed aid into northern Gaza, including the Erez crossing, which has been closed since October 7th. And the aid can't come soon enough. The U.N. Secretary General is warning, quote, Gaza is on the brink of mass starvation. The increasing outcry over the humanitarian crisis in Gaza has also put a spotlight on U.S. military aid to Israel. The United States is by far the largest supplier of military aid, providing more than $130 billion since the nation's founding in 1948. And now a growing number of Democrats is calling for conditions on that aid. I think we're at the point where uh, President Biden has said, and I have said, and others have said, if Benjamin Netanyahu, prime minister, were to order the IDF into Rafa at scale, they were to drop thousand pound bombs and send in a battalion uh, to go after Hamas and make no provision for civilians uh, or for humanitarian aid that, that I would vote to condition aid to Israel. I've never said that before. I've never been here before. When we talk about conditions, the bottom line condition has to be full accommodation for the delivery of humanitarian aid to the suffering people in Palestine. Yesterday, President Biden and Secretary of State Antony Blinken received a letter signed by more than three dozen House Democrats urging them to reconsider the decision to authorize an arms package transfer to Israel and to withhold future transfers until there's an investigation into the airstrike that killed those aid workers. My next guest signed that letter. Joining me now, Democratic Congresswoman Madeline Dean of Pennsylvania, member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Congresswoman Dean, as always, uh, thank you for coming to the Saturday show. What kind of conditions do you want placed on aid to Israel? Jonathan, it's good to be with you. And obviously this week, the grievous, uh, precise attack on three vehicles carrying the World Central Kitchen aid workers, killing seven of them. Uh, has provoked extraordinary outrage, anger, uh, disappointment uh, across the board. Uh, I'm sure it's true also in Israel. We have to start with one thing. The enemy here is Hamas. It was Hamas who attacked Israel on October the 7th. And while we lost these angels, as uh, Chef uh, Jose Andres says, 
Uh, do you know that we've lost more than 200 other aid workers in Gaza in the last six months? I was there in Israel twice now during the, this conflict, first on November the 11th and then again in February. We met with UNRWA. At that time, they had lost 147 aid workers. And the, the chief of UNRWA, the director sitting in Rafa, an American military uh, hero, uh, said, uh, we have lost more than 147 workers, and yet every day the remaining ones come and work. What do we have to do in terms of conditioning aid? I signed the letter that was uh, uh, drafted by Mr. Pocan, uh, Ms. Schakowsky, and um, Mr. McGovern. Uh, I'm proud to have signed on to it to say we have to take a look at what aid, what military munitions are going to Israel. After all, the use of 2,000-pound dumb bombs in Gaza, so imprecise, with the ability to take out whole buildings, is unacceptable. 33,000 people are dead. It is estimated that one half of those are children. And Israel has not told us the number in that that is actually Hamas. So we've got a tremendous number of civilians dead. We have the responsibility and the right, frankly, uh, as Congress, as this administration, um, under the Memorandum of, of uh, Security, number 20, uh, dated February the 8th, we have the responsibility of oversight and conditioning aid where military use is not uh, discriminate. Congresswoman, I've been calling the deadly, that the deadly airstrike on World Central Kitchen a turning point in the U.S.-Israel relationship and in the relationship between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu. Am I overstating things here? I'm not sure. Uh, I have to tell you, I'm very proud with the president. I spoke with the White House the morning of the phone call with Mr. Netanyahu this week. Uh, and certainly, we have heard from the readout uh, that this was a very tough phone call. Uh, and what I agree with the president on is that it's unacceptable, the number of deaths uh, and the deaths of innocent civilians, not to mention humanitarian workers, angels. Uh, mm -hmm. what, Mr., uh, what Mr. Biden told Mr. Netanyahu was, number one, now a temporary ceasefire to get the hostages out. I called for a bilateral ceasefire February the 28th uh, in order to get the hostages out and humanitarian aid in. Number two, what we know the president said, and I'm very proud of him for doing this, is to Mr. Netanyahu. Mr. Netanyahu, enable your negotiators, your hostage negotiators, to get the hostages out immediately. It baffles me. You noted that tomorrow will mark six months since this horrendous, grievous, grotesque attack. And I saw evidence of it as I visited Israel. But how is it that Mr. Netanyahu has not been focused singularly on the release of the hostages? Congresswoman, last question for you on this. Speaking of the prime minister, a member of his war cabinet, Benny Gantz, has called for early elections for September. Is a change in leadership in Israel what is needed to, to bring an end to this war? I'm very mindful that I'm a member of one government. It is not on me to tell Israeli citizens what to do. But I see in the streets the pictures you are showing right now. Mm -hmm. Mr. Netanyahu's prosecution of this war, we can all observe, uh, has been indiscriminate and has not been clear. And I am very critical of the prosecution of this war. Uh, so Mr. Gans and, and Israeli citizens themselves, and importantly, Palestinians, need to have elections. We need ultimately, Jonathan, I know you know this, and Mr. Netanyahu's not interested in it, a two-state solution. The region cries for a two-state solution for dignity and sovereignty for two peoples. Uh, that's what has to happen. Mm -hmm. And I bet that has to happen by way of elections, both in Israel and in Gaza and in Palestine. Let's not forget the West Bank. This year's presidential election is about choices. And Donald Trump is making it very clear exactly what he'll do if reelected, especially when it comes to race and immigration. On the campaign trail, Trump has falsely accused migrants of a, quote, border bloodbath and uses dehumanizing language when he talks about them. They're sending prisoners, murderers, drug dealers, mental patients and terrorists, the worst they have in every country all over the world. Uh, the Democrats say, please don't call them animals. They're humans. I said, no, they're not humans. They're not humans. They're animals. 
Trump and his allies are also threatening to carry out mass deportations, use mi migrant detention camps, and potentially bring back the zero-tolerance policy that put children in cages. This week, Trump attended a gala for the director of the family separation program and hasn't ruled out reinstating it. And while Trump's attacks on asylum seekers are certainly racist, there's so much more. Have you heard about his plans to uplift only white people? Axios reports that Trump wants the Justice Department to roll back protections for people of color to focus on discrimination against whites. Trump's allies have already been testing this anti-DEI framework in court and managed to block billions in pandemic relief for women and minority-owned businesses. There's one mastermind behind all these cruelty-as-the-point policies, and his name isn't Donald Trump. Meet Stephen Miller, the former Trump White House advisor and far-right extremist plotting Trump's nightmarish second term. Joining me now, MSNBC political contributor Jelani Cobb. He's a staff writer for The New Yorker and dean of the Columbia Journalism School. Also with me is investigative journalist Jean Guerrero. She's the author of Hate Monger, Steve Miller, Stephen Miller, Donald Trump, and the White Nationalist Agenda. Jean, Jelani, thank you both very much for coming to the Saturday show. Jean, help us understand Stephen Miller's ideology. What, what's his vision for America? His vision is a white nationalist America, and this agenda that you described is something that he's been dreaming about for a very long time. In my book, I trace how Miller was radicalized as a teenager by far-right provocateurs who believed that racism against black and brown people was not a problem and that the real problem in American society was racism against whites. This is an idea that originated with white supremacists like David Duke, who in the 1970s was calling white men the, quote, real second-class citizens in America. But while back then it was largely rejected and fringe, in 2024 it's mainstream GOP politics, mm -hmm. thanks to mm -hmm. Stephen Miller. Mm -hmm. and, and Jelani, yeah. Miller's law firm released this ad in October 2022. Listen to this. When did racism against white people become okay? Progressive corporations, airlines, universities, all openly discriminate against white Americans. Racism is always wrong. The left's anti-white bigotry must stop. We are all entitled to equal treatment under law. Jelani, the floor is yours. Well, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, I would point uh, your viewers to a body of scholarly work that examines these very questions about the ways in which uh, anti-discrimination policy can be utilized against the group that has, has historically been subject to discrimination and for the group that has historically benefited from that discrimination. The name of that body of scholarship, if you want to guess and you haven't already, is critical race theory. Uh, and so this is a kind of textbook example of this very thing. Uh, I do want to make one point uh, about the earlier question, which is that this is part of a much older tradition. Uh, you know, this is the mythology of the lost cause, uh, how Confederates after the end of the Civil War actually envisioned themselves, people who had fought a war for the right to buy, sell, rape, abuse, traffic, and exploit human beings, envisioned themselves as the victims. Uh, and that came about in the immediate aftermath of the war. Uh, if you looked in, at the debates of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, uh, one of the more notable things you hear is this same strain. Uh, Southern legislator after Southern legislator gets up and says that they are opposed to discrimination and therefore they cannot support the 1964 Civil Rights Act because they believe it discriminates against white people. Uh, and it's that same kind of playbook. So this is not a novel development. This is something that we've seen for a really long time. Mm -hmm. you, you know what, Jane? I was going to jump to immigration, an immigration question. But given what Jelani just said, I'm just wondering, how has Miller been preparing to overhaul the Justice Department? Well, primarily it's been through his America First legal nonprofit, which has focused on dismantling programs that are meant to benefit historically underrepresented and historically marginalized communities, um, such as programs benefiting black farmers or women-owned and minority-owned restaurants. Um, and my, my prediction is that in a second Trump term, based on everything that Miller has been doing through America First Legal, 
we would not only see the Department of Justice weaponized to dismantle affirmative action programs benefiting people of color across the country, we would also see the creation of an affirmative action agenda focused on benefiting white people. And Jelani, then what would it mean to lose the Justice Department as a, as a backstop on safeguarding civil rights? I mean, it would be a rear guard march, no question. Uh, you know, what would happen would be uh, a kind of open season uh, for for any kind of uh, equitable policy or practice. Anything that has addressed uh, the legacy and impact of unequal treatment of inequality, discrimination, and so on, uh, would be vulnerable in that regard. And so that's what that world might look like. And Stephen Miller would be at the center of it all. Jelani Cobb, Jean Guerrero, thank you both very much for coming to The Saturday Show. After being away for two weeks, Congress returns to Washington on Tuesday with a to-do list filled with daunting challenges. At the top of that list, the Israel-Hamas war. Today marks six months since the deadly October 7th attack on Israel when Hamas killed 1,200 people and took more than 250 hostages. A lot has changed in the past six months. Eleven days after the terrorist attack, President Biden flew to Israel and embraced Netanyahu in a show of solidarity with the Israeli people. Fast forward to Thursday. The president had a tense phone call with Netanyahu from the White House over his execution of the war, which has decimated the Gaza Strip, killed more than 33,000 Palestinians and displaced 1.9 million more. The reason for that phone call was the killing of seven aid workers with World Central Kitchen, whose founder, Chef Jose Andres, said this about how Israel is waging war. This doesn't seem a war against terror. This doesn't seem anymore a war about defending Israel. This really, at this point, seems it's a war against humanity itself. You cannot be conducting war in such a way. You cannot be destroying every building, every hospital, every school, every university. You cannot be destroying just the future for decades of more than two million Palestinians. Today, Israel's military announced that it would be withdrawing troops from southern Gaza. Ceasefire negotiations also resumed in Cairo, with American, Qatari, and Egyptian officials overseeing talks between Israel and Hamas. And with Congress returning this week, pressure will build here at home as the United States prepares for potential retaliation from Iran over Israeli airstrikes in Syria on April 1st. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said today the standoff raises the stakes for Congress to pass foreign aid. Tensions in the Middle East are very high. That's why we want to pass the National Security Supplemental. It's critical, and we are all urging Speaker Johnson to put it on the floor of the House. But over in the Republican-controlled House, everything from military funding for Israel and Ukraine to rebuilding the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore will be on the docket, as will the future of the speakership of Mike Johnson. He's still at risk of a motion to vacate from Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, who former Speaker Kevin McCarthy seems to think is a serious legislator. One thing I've always found about Marjorie is she's a very serious legislator that deals with policy. Uh, I beg to differ. The fact that she fill, filed the motion after Johnson saved us from a government shutdown shows that MTG is always itching to punish any real attempt at governing, which means Democrats could be faced with a tough decision. Save Johnson or let him sink. Joining me now, Democratic Congressman Ro Khanna of California, member of the House Armed Services Committee, and Democratic Congressman Jerry Connolly of Virginia, member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, both are members of the Oversight Committee. Congressman, welcome to the Sunday Show. Thank you both very much for, for being here. All right, uh, Congressman Khanna, you said you would save Speaker Johnson's, uh, the, the gavel, uh, on two conditions. Have those changed? No, if he brings a clean bill on Ukraine funding, I think he would be doing the responsible thing, and he should be funding uh, the bridge the, in Baltimore. I mean, those are common-sense priorities, and I would be willing to work across the aisle if he does that. Uh, Congressman Colony? No, uh, I don't believe rewarding Speaker Johnson for doing his job is a smart policy, and there are lots of problems, I think, doing that. He is the most ideological right-wing speaker since the 1830s. 
everything he stands for is antithetical to democratic values. And, and, and keeping him in office is being complicit when we do that. Secondly, uh, this is extortion. Where do we stop? This time it's Ukraine. What is it next? And thirdly, there's viability. What kind of shelf life is Mike Johnson going to have in his own caucus when he's the speaker at the sufferance of Democratic votes? Uh, that's not going to be a long shelf life. Well, Congressman Connolly, let me stick with you here. So if you don't save Speaker Johnson, who who's going to be the next speaker? Well, hopefully Hakeem Jeffries. <laughs> but, but Republicans, okay. Republicans there are we down, agree. <laughs> <laughs> the Republicans are down to a one-vote majority. It's very fragile. Uh, but it's not our job to save a Republican speaker, especially one as far right as Mike Johnson. He's wrong from a Democratic point of view on every issue imaginable. Gun rights. Uh, women's reproductive rights, LGBTQ rights. Uh, he litigated. He not only voted the wrong way on certifying President Biden's election, he litigated it. Um, what Democrat wants to be associated with that kind of record? Well, well, no, Jerry's right on all the facts. I mean, he is very, very extreme. He's ideological, horrible record on LGBTQ plus equality, horrible record on abortion rights. Uh, he did actually litigate overthrowing 2020. The question just is, people in Ukraine desperately need this aid. And if he doesn't bring that bill uh, to the floor, you're basically giving Putin uh, a victory. And we need the money for the bridge. So it's, I would not vote affirmatively for Johnson, but could I vote to to table something if, if it's part of a deal on a clean Ukraine bill, I would entertain it. All right, guys. But, uh, disabuse me uh, uh, of this cynical view, but I, it's not even cynical. I just have no faith that Speaker Johnson will be able to get a Ukraine funding bill through and the Israel funding bill through um, the funding for the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Am I wrong in thinking that? I mean, it's great to go and say, hey, if you do this, um, you'll get my vote. But I don't even think you'll get to that well, point. Well, I think there are three separate issues. On the Francis uh, Scott Key Bridge, we're talking about $600 million. I mean, we put almost a trillion dollars into the Pentagon and defense budget. It is shameful that we can't get $600 million allocated right away. On Ukraine, I think that aid has to be a clean vote. The Israel aid is more complicated. I was on a letter with Speaker Pelosi uh, and about 40 Democrats saying no more offensive weapons to uh, Israel while they're still uh, killing civilians in an indiscriminate way. So I think that's going to be a more complicated vote. Well, I, I think that we, w we will get to a vote on both Ukraine aid and on rebuilding the Key Bridge in Baltimore. Uh, there are over 300 votes in the, in the House of Representatives, bipartisan, to vote for Ukraine aid. Uh, Speaker Johnson knows that. And there is going to be increasing pressure on him from uh, moderate common sense Republicans who support aid to Ukraine. Key leaders in the Republican caucus, the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, chairman of the Armed Services Committee, chairman of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, all are outspoken advocates for Ukraine. He can't continue to bottle that up. Let the will of the House be exercised. Bring a bill to the floor and, and, and we either pass it or we don't. You know, Congressman Khanna talked about the, the letter that you signed with um, um, former Speaker Pelosi putting conditions on aid to, on, on aid to Israel. Senator Chris Van Hollen um, today urged the United States to withhold arms to Israel until the humanitarian crisis in Gaza is addressed. Let's listen to what he had to say. Until those conditions yeah. are met, then no, we should not be sending more uh, offensive weapons uh, to Israel, not to stop them permanently, but to effectively use our levers. That's what we're asking the president of the United States to do. Congressman Connolly, what do you make of what Senator Van Hollen said? And did you sign, did you sign that letter that Congressman Khanna and the former, former Speaker Pelosi signed? I was not aware of the letter. Okay. So it wasn't something I could sign. Um, I favor uh, the position I think Chris Van Hollen just articulated, which is we have to use our leverage on the Netanyahu government to open up massive humanitarian aid in Gaza. We should not be providing more offensive weaponry that could be used in Gaza until and unless uh, the conditions the president set down with Netanyahu are met. Uh, they have not been met yet. Um, I want to turn to one more thing. Um, the House Intelligence Chair, Mike, Congressman Mike Turner, accuses colleagues of spreading Russian propaganda uh, in the House. Let's listen. 
We see directly coming from Russia the attempts to mask communications that are anti-Ukraine and pro-Russia messages, some of which we even hear being uttered on the House floor. I mean, there are members of Congress today who still incorrectly say that this conflict between Russia and Ukraine is over NATO, which, of course, it is not. And Congressman Conant, that's pretty... I mean, that's the Republican chair of the Intelligence Committee saying something that I'd gotten used to them ignoring. You don't have to be on the Intelligence Committee to know that Republicans have been echoing talking points for Putin. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling. The party of Reagan basically wants to appease Putin, give them a chunk of Ukraine, let him do what he wants. And what is that sending to Xi Jinping? What signal is it sending to him? Take a t chunk of Taiwan? It's, it's uh, appalling. In the go ahead, go ahead, Congressman. So I'm on the Oversight Committee, and I watch Jim Jordan on Judiciary and Jim Comer on Oversight, who are collaborating on an impeachment effort against President Biden. Who is their primary witness? Their primary witness is a Russian named Alexander Smirnov. He is in jail today because he lied to the FBI about the whole Burisma scandal mm -hmm. that turned out to be a lie. He wasn't there. He didn't hear it. There were no bribes. That's their primary witness. And he admitted that his sources are, are Russian agents. So it's not only that Russian bots are infiltrating Repu uh, Republican propaganda. They're actually prime witnesses for now a thoroughly discredited impeachment. And what he did was get dirt on Joe Biden. That yeah. was the whole operation. Which was false. He made right. it he, he tried to get dirt. Right. Right. He, made he tried it to up. get dirt. Yeah. Sort of like that raccoon with the cotton candy <laughs> over the bowl of water and it drops in, it disappears. And the raccoon's like, what? what? Yeah. Congressman, before I, I can't let you go without asking you about <laughs> the bill you filed uh, in Congress in response to this effort to rename Dulles which is an architecturally beautiful airport. I don't care what any of you folks say about it. Um, <laughs> to rename it for Donald Trump, you right. introduced a bill to rename a prison in Florida after Trump. Well, there's a, there's a nice <laughs> federal penitentiary right near Mar-a-Lago. And I just thought, for a guy who's now got 88 criminal indictments pending, criminal, mm -hmm. plus two major civil penalty trials that have already been resolved, costing him about a half a, million, half a billion dollars, I think it's only fitting that if we if Republicans really want to honor Donald Trump, the most appropriate way to do that is to name a federal prison. He might be visiting soon uh, after Donald J. Trump. Gary, you may get the Trump endorsement for that. I don't think there's a building he wouldn't want his name on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Congressman Connor, are you a, are you going to sign on as a sponsor? I sign on to almost any bill Jerry Connolly. He's one of the smartest members of Congress. I love how he said almost. <laughs> Congressman Roe Khan of California, Congressman Jerry Connolly of Virginia, thank you both very you, much John. for coming to this Sunday show. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.